A lot of us intuitively think of the derivative at a point as the slope of its tangent line. And we think of the second derivative as representing curvature. Graphically, it's the rate of change of the slope. A negative second derivative means the slope is decreasing. And a positive sign means the slope is increasing. The sign of the second derivative is really useful because it can help classify points as maxima or minima. But the second derivative is only a number in single variable calculus. In multivariable calculus, when we have a function with multiple inputs and a single output, like the function here, the first derivative is no longer a number, but becomes a vector called the gradient. Even worse, the second derivative changes from a number to a matrix called the Hessian. And so we can't just look at the sign of the second derivative to classify maxima and minima, because what does it even mean for a matrix to be positive or negative? The derivative is a measure of a function's rate of change, but in higher dimensions, the rate of change depends on both the location as well as the direction. If we want to find the rate of change along this direction, one thing we can do is to intersect the function with a plane along that direction and form its cross-section. With some work, we can find the equation for this yellow curve, which you can see is one-dimensional, so we can calculate its derivatives in the usual way. But it might get annoying that we have to find this curve every time we want to take a derivative in a different direction. Luckily, we don't need to do this. This is where the gradient and the Hessian come in. If we can find this mysterious gradient in Hessian, we can very easily compute the first and second derivatives along any direction we want. I'll first derive the gradient using an argument which I find to be pretty intuitive and then use similar reasoning to derive the Hessian. Near the end, I'll show how the gradient and the Hessian can be used to find and classify local optima in higher dimensions. Let's first start with the simpler function. Our goal in this section is to figure out how to compute the derivative along any direction in an easy way. Suppose for simplicity, we want to find the derivatives from this red point which is the origin. One direction we might want to try first is moving along the x-axis. This should be simple because the y-value doesn't change. We can take a look at the cross-section, which we can see is a one-dimensional curve. y is zero along this curve, so we can plug that into our function. This is the function for our cross-section, and because we just have one variable left, we can easily take the derivative. At x equals 0, we get the derivative is minus 1. This is precisely the slope of the tangent line within this cross-section. Also, there's nothing special about the origin. We can do this for any slice parallel to the x-axis and calculate the derivative. By treating y as a constant and differentiating, we get what's called the partial derivative with respect to x, which we denote as f sub x. We can similarly find the derivative along the y direction with x held constant, and this gives us the partial derivative with respect to y. And geometrically, if we look at this cross-section and we plug in the coordinates of the red point into f sub y, this gives us the slope of its tangent line. Now, computing these partial derivatives is pretty easy because it's pretty much just like in the single variable case. But what if we want to find the derivative along some other direction like this one. Of course, we could find the equation of the cross-section and differentiate that, but there's actually an easier way that uses these partial derivatives that we calculated just now. This is the contour plot for the same function. You can think of it as looking down on the function from above, where lighter colors represent higher function values. We wanted to find the derivatives from the origin along some direction. Let's say this direction is given by this vector v. Our strategy is to use the definition of the derivative. We first take the function value of a point along this direction. Let's say it has coordinates h to h, and then subtract from that the value at the origin. Finally, divide this by the distance between the two points. If we take a look at this cross-section, this is exactly the slope of the secant line between these two points. 
The slope of the secant line approaches the derivative as h approaches 0. So when h is a small number, this will be a good approximation for the derivative. Our strategy is to find some kind of approximation for f of h to h. But we only want to use the partial derivatives at the origin. If we can do that, then we can just use the partial derivatives to calculate derivatives in other directions. We do this by first approximating f of h0, which we know is the value at the origin plus some change along the x-axis. And then we can estimate f of h to h by taking f of h0 and then estimating the change along the y-axis. For the first approximation, we can look at the cross-section along the x-axis and use the tangent line at the origin as an approximation. This means the estimated change is f sub x at the origin times the distance, which is h. This distance between these two yellow points is the approximation error, and it goes to 0 when h goes to 0. Likewise, for the second approximation, the estimated change is roughly f sub y at h0 times the distance, which is 2h. This again gets more exact when h is small. Combining these terms, we get an approximation for f of h to h. We can plug this into our derivative formula. After we grind out the algebra, we find the derivative is equal to this term. Now, there's still one issue left, which is, we'd ideally just use the partial derivatives at the origin. This term here is the rate of change from this white point, which is close to the origin, but not quite. However, these two numbers should be very close since h is very small. This is true if the partial derivatives are continuous. So assuming it's continuous, we can replace h for 0. One final step. We can rewrite this as the dot product of these two vectors. This vector of partial derivatives is what we refer to as the gradient. It's denoted by this upside down triangle notation. And this other vector is the direction that's scaled to a length of 1. Since we're finding the derivative along a direction, this is called the directional derivative. In our example, we calculated the partial derivatives before, which is minus 1 and 0. So our directional derivative is minus 1 over the square root of 5. If we take the cross section, Minus 1 over the square root of 5 is the slope of this tangent line. And there's nothing special about this direction. We can take the dot product between the gradient at some other point with any unit vector v. This gives the derivative in direction v at point ab. So this gradient vector that only contains the partial derivatives is able to find the derivative in any direction we want. But remember, this equation only holds when the partial derivatives are continuous. When the partial derivatives are not continuous, we might not be able to use the gradient to calculate the directional derivative. In this example, at the origin, we have both partial derivatives are 0, implying the gradient is 0. And if we use this formula, then all directional derivatives should also be 0. But the derivative along this direction is not 0. So this equation isn't holding. And it's because the partial derivatives are not continuous at the origin. This is the graph of the partial derivative with respect to x. And you can see that there's a discontinuity at the origin. In practice, you likely won't encounter these functions that much. So there shouldn't be a problem using the gradient to calculate the directional derivative. Just like the gradient lets us compute the directional derivative, the Hessian lets us compute the directional second derivative. Given a point in a direction, the Hessian lets us find the second derivative along that direction. We'll compute the second derivative from its definition and show how the Hessian follows naturally from an analysis similar to what we did for gradients. Like before, Let's say we want to find the second derivative at the origin along this direction v and passes through the point h to h for some small value h. So we can take the cross section like before and find the second derivative at this point. 
Equivalently, we can find the derivative of the function's derivative to get the second derivative. In this example, since the first derivative is already a line, we just need to find the slope of this line. The first derivatives at these two points is the gradient vector times the direction. So the second derivative is going to be the directional derivative at h2h minus the derivative at the origin, all divided by the distance from the point h2h to the origin. Expanding out the first dot product gives us this. Now, similar to before, we need to approximate the partial derivatives at h2h. Remember that we derived this useful approximation. This holds for any function with continuous partial derivatives as long as h is small. In particular, if we replace f with f sub x and f sub y, we get these approximations. Here, we have second partial derivatives. f x y means we first take the partial with respect to x, then with respect to y. And the other terms are similar. We can plug these approximations into our derivative equation. I'm going to skip the algebra, so you'll have to trust me that the term simplifies into this. And we can write this more compactly in matrix form. This formula gives the directional second derivative. And like before, we can replace the direction with some other vector v, and the origin with some other point. But also like before, v has to have a length of 1, or this formula wouldn't work. This matrix here, which you can probably guess, is called the Hessian, and it's usually denoted as h sub f. So this result is basically saying, if we multiply the Hessian before and after with a unit length direction vector, it gives us the second derivative in that direction. Okay, let's do a quick recap of what we learned so far, and then talk about how they can be applied to optimization. We learned that to compute the directional derivative, we just take the dot product of the gradient vector with the direction we want. And if we want the directional second derivative, we take the direction times the Hessian times the direction. For all of this, remember the direction vector v has to be unit length. So this is the main geometric intuition behind the gradient and the Hessian. I think a lot of people might not understand the Hessian gives the directional second derivative, but I think it's really useful to understand this. Now, there are a lot of implications to all of this. I'll show you an example from optimization. You might have learned about the first derivative test in calculus. It says that at a local max or a min, the first derivative is zero. Visually, this means we have a flat tangent line at these points. But the other direction isn't necessarily true. We can have a zero derivative, but not necessarily a local max or a min. We can see this in the function x cubed. At x equals zero, we have a zero derivative, but this isn't a local maximum or minimum. So this other direction doesn't hold. In math lingo, we can say that a zero derivative is necessary but not a sufficient condition for a local optima. There is a similar condition in higher dimensions. For a point to be a local optima in higher dimensions, the first derivative needs to be zero for every cross-section we look at. This means if we choose any cross-section, there has to be a flat tangent line at that point. Therefore, the directional derivative has to be zero for all directions, implying the gradient has to be zero. And geometrically, the tangent plane has to be flat at a local optima. But similar to before, a zero gradient doesn't guarantee we have a local optimum. We have a zero gradient at the origin, meaning a flat tangent plane. But this isn't a local max or a min, so once again, a zero gradient is a necessary condition, but isn't sufficient. In single variable calculus, there's also something called the second derivative test. After we identify the points with a zero derivative, a positive second derivative means it's a minimum, and a negative sign means it's a maximum. This is the second derivative test. In the case when the second derivative is zero, 
it can sometimes still be a local optimum. This function is very flat at x equals 0, so the second derivative is 0, but it's still a maximum there. So this is a sufficient but not necessary condition. The multivariate version is that if we have a point with a 0 gradient, if the second derivative is negative for every cross-section, then this point will be a local maximum. This means v transpose times the Hessian times v has to be negative for all v. So now we can state the second derivative test in higher dimensions. First, we need a point with a zero gradient. In single variable functions, remember we needed a point with a zero first derivative, so this is similar. Now, the main difference is that if we have a negative directional second derivative for all directions, we have a local max. So we basically replaced a negative second derivative with a negative directional second derivative. Likewise, if the directional second derivatives are positive, we have a local min. Also, although I didn't explicitly write this, these Hessian matrices are for the point AB. So you might be wondering how do we know if our Hessian satisfies these properties. Fortunately, these matrices have been studied a lot in linear algebra. They're called negative definite and positive definite matrices. This is a big topic, so I'm not really going to go into it. But an equivalent definition is that the Hessian has all negative or all positive eigenvalues. There are algorithms to find eigenvalues for a matrix and we can use them to check this condition. So yeah, eigenvalues do show up a lot, so don't fall asleep in your linear algebra class. There's a bit more I want to say about gradients and Hessians, so I'm planning on a second video on this topic. If you like this video, please subscribe to see other videos like this. It takes a lot of time to make these videos, so I really appreciate any support. See you next time.